Rockham is bounded by the River Bure. This river, rising at Metton Constable and emptying at Yarmouth Harbour, bounds the village of Roxham almost four and a half miles from a point which, if you think of a horseshoe in inverted position, starts at uh, the top of one side and goes right round the bridge to the top the other side. The distance is about four and a half miles and the distance from the two tops of the horseshoes would be about three quarters of a mile. The centre of the river is the political and the administrative boundary and it runs the centre of the river and is and is cited as a, a dotted line running exactly dead centre of the river around that space. At the spot where the Roxham boundary begins, upstream, the opposite bank is below and this lasts almost to Roxham Bridge, about halfway along in the direction of Yarmouth. And then it becomes Houghton on the opposite bank, the village of Houghton. And that extends right away far beyond the end of the Roxham boundary to Horning, Horning, at a point near Horning Swan. Until 1614, the Roxham on the east, on the west bank, and Hoverton on the east bank, <coughs> were separated so far as roadway is concerned, when a single track bridge was erected connecting Roxham with Horning. Uh, connecting Roxham with Houghton. The roads thus connected were just rough countryside roads of uh, flint and very rough. Roxham in those days had a um, population of about 200 and Houghton would be just a little less somewhere 180. One can hardly speak of Roxham without including Hopton continuously, and so the observation here made uh, covering both Roxham and Hopton, and there's a good reason for this. Roxham and Hopton in those days Socially, commercially, were entirely separate. Reed banks, fodder for the knowledge, uh, for the reed beds, supplied very much of the Norfolk thatch. Sedge and marsh fodder supplied what is called litter for the horse-drawn vehicles for the horses on the horse-drawn vehicles. And uh, it was supplied uh, by Horning from Hopton, went down to Yarmouth and was transported to London for the London cabbies, the horse-drawn cabbies and trams. And from Roxham, it was conveyed also down the river to Yarmouth and was dispatched wherever it was required. About 1876, the London, the Great Eastern Railway was formed, and it is here that the confusion commenced, because the railway arriving as it did to Rockham, crossed the river, into Hopeton and made the station, the railway station called Rockham Station, in Hopeton within the Hopeton boundary. No one knows why, 
accepting it is said that when the surveyors came and asked local people which was which, some people in Hopeton called it Hopeton, H-U-R-F-T-O-N, really H-U-V-E-T-O-N. Some called it Hopeton John, simply because the ecclesiastical portion near the river was called Hopeton St. John, for which there is a special St. John Church. And the portion further in and still and nearer to Horning was calling Hopeton Peter, which means to say Hopeton St. Peter, and there is a Hopeton St. Peter Church. And so the railway authorities thought, well, we can't have Hopeton John, Hopeton Peter, and Hofton, we better have Roxham. You can't put mess about with that. And so they called the station Roxham. And here comes the change from agriculture and uh, the countryside occupations and, and the work of the Roxham. Here comes the change. An agricultural labourer, an agricultural labourer, born in uh, poor circumstances, found that working on a brick field for a shilling a day was not very profitable. This would be about 18, oh, 1870. And uh, he, he became a houseman. And at the house, which was at Brook in Norfolk, there was a dinghy, a small sailing boat on a, a patch of water which fronted the hall. He got permission to teach himself to sail, and that changed his life entirely. He wanted to build a boat himself, but couldn't get anyone to teach him. So he made, he apprenticed himself to a carpenter at Colman's Carrowark Works, Carrow Works, Mr. John Loyne's, the name of the man, or the boy, young man in those days, and uh, Colman's, of course, is connected with Colman's mustard, known all over the world. While working there, he became foreman carpenter. He was a good fellow. He knew timber, and he knew how to build. He knew how to make boxes who were required for carry work and the maintenance of the buildings and so on. In his spare time, they were a rather large family, in his spare time at a place called Monastery Yard in, uh, in Norwich, he hired a shed. He bought an old derelict boat, no longer fit to float, but it was still complete and lying on land. From this he took every piece he could as a template or pattern, and he built a boat from the new timber from the old templates. Unfortunately, he didn't realize that the different timber was of different weight. One side he built of larch and the other side of oak. And the oak side went lopsided as soon as the boat was completed and was launched in the river. That taught him, that was his first lesson. So he built another one, all the same timber and that was successful. That was a rowing boat. Then he thought of this little sailing boat on Brook Mare, and he said, uh, I'll build a boat. I'll build a sailing boat this time. So he got the dimensions of a sailing boat, and he built one. He made his own mast, of course, his own oars, his own Rolex, his own rudder, and his own boat, his own floorboards. Then he made some awning rods, put a hood over because he couldn't build a cabin, it wasn't big enough, but he wanted to shelter the inside of the boat from the rain, the bad weather. So he made two uprights and a cross piece, one side, two uprights and a cross piece, the other side, made his own awning from canvas that he purchased, and there he had a sailing boat with an awning. The mast was just a pitch pine, thin, I'm not so sure it wasn't large, but I don't know what it was. Anyhow, 
he made his own spars for the sail and just uh, he didn't complicate himself with the jib he just made one what is called a una sail single sail and the tail itself he made also because there's not much money about in those days <coughs> took this boat and sailed on the river Wenson at Norwich. Some Norwich people were interested in this, and two uh, adventurous young men hired this boat. They were bank clerks. They hired this boat and thought they would explore the river. They sailed off one Sunday morning down past Bramerton to Cantley, where the Cantley sugar beet factory now is, right down to Braden Water, which is a wide expense, uh, a wide expanse of water, which uh, even today puts fear into the heart of some people to cross it. But they crossed it all right and got to Yarmouth Harbour. And when they saw the water running out at Yarmouth Harbour rather fast, they turned the other way and waited for the turn of the tide and sailed upstream. And so doing, they came to Stokesby. At Stokes, from Stokesby they went on to Horning, Hakel Bridge and the Horning, and then on to Southhouse, and of course came to Rockland. You know, the marshlands around Horning and the marshlands who were worse around Hakel were of no interest to people with an eye for a country scene and landscape. But they found that kind of country when they got to Rocks and Broad, Southhouse and Rocks and Broad, just above Horning by river. And here they sailed about onto Sadhouse Broad, onto Rocks and Broad, and upstream to Rocks and Bridge, the bridge built in 1614. And alongside there were two ale houses which were used by the lighter men and the wherry men who did the freightage on the river. So they stayed there, had a meal, and went on up to Cotterstall, just as pretty, just as nice, and even beyond Cotterstall, when the lock in those days was in good order, they went up to Oxnead. But they spent so much time that by the time they got back to Roxham Bridge, it was time to hand the boat over to the owner at the end of the holiday, but the owner was by water, 47 miles away, down to Yarmouth Harbour, across Braden Water, up, up the River Yare to Norwich. And so they decided to leave the boat at Roxham and walk home and go and tell the owner of the boat where, the, where it was, where they'd left it. And the owner, believe me, had to bring a handcart and two men with him to put this boat onto the handcart and take it back by to Norwich over the rough old road, down the hill at Rackheath and up the other side. A quite a, a laborious task. The boat still was still hired from Norwich down to uh, to uh, Serlingham Ferry and to Coldham Hall and different places on the river. But eventually two more men hired it for an outing and they finished up at Roxham. Well, the owner didn't think it would be wise to continuously get this boat up from Roxham by road. So he decided to leave it at Roxham and let it from Roxham instead of from Norwich. He left it in charge of the landlord of the King's Head, the little alehouse, and uh, he had an arrangement with him to act as his agent. When the business went so well, he decided to give up his work as a carpenter and become a boat builder and a boat hirer at Roxham. And that was the commencement of the holiday yachting at Roxham, which today is now famous. And there was further success to come because by 1890, he had built larger boats, boats for cabins, rather heavy, rather heavily. 
fitted with sails, heavy masts, and a type of boat that requires uh, a knowledgeable waterman called a skipper uh, to sail them. And people came to Roxham, or went to Roxham, and uh, hired these boats which were sailed by the skippers. John Loins made his main na uh, made his business well known throughout the country by attending fishery exhibitions with plans and models of his boats and uh, a flat uh, model like a billiard table of the river on which they could sail all set out in uh, a condition which attracted the people who saw it and decided to have a go. And they went to Roxham and the building flourished. The boat building industry and the boat building hard and flourished. But John Loins had aims of higher things. In addition to this business at uh, Roxham, he thought that he would go to Holland on the Friesland mares and see if there's any possibility to set up business there as well. He liked what he saw and he built larger boats, big enough to accommodate six people, probably eight people if they tucked in tight. And what to me is remarkable is that the boy who was only an agricultural labourer could come to Roxham establish this business and build boats which sailed from Roxham Bridge to Lowestoft and were then went across and sailed to the Hook of Holland through the Zyder Zee up to the Freestone Nairs and the business started. <laughs> but there's always a snag somewhere. John Lawrence had started the business in a country which started a war in South Africa with the British Empire. And the Dutch people being the Boers also in South Africa, the, there was a quite a big disagreement. And the, and the Dutch people in the Friesen Mare stoned the people who went over to have holidays there Three of the boats had to be sold, and three of them sailed back. And they were in commission here at Roxham long beyond the turn of the century. In fact, I had one about ten years ago, one of these old boats. But they, of course, things advance. Ideas advance, designs advance. And so at the turn of the century, or just before the turn of the century, Robert Collins, a builder of lighters and wherries, the big lighters and wherries which sailed abroad in those days as for freight only, and uh, Herbert Bunn, he was also a, a boat builder in a small way at Cotterstill, he thought he'd better come to Rocks thing was flourishing very quickly. Alfred Collins managed to get here. The North Broad Yachting Company was established. And uh, a man named George Smith came from Beckles and, uh, and set himself up at the Horseshoes Hotel, Roxham they called it. And just to show how you can't divide Roxham from Hopton. John Loins was in Roxham. Robert Collins came in Roxham. Graham Bunn set up in Roxham. Alfred Collins set up in Roxham. But Jack Poles and Co. set up both sides of the river. Ernest Collins set up both sides of the river. C and G Press from Bilo came to both sides of the river. And establishments of all kinds. Barclays Bank opened a bank in a cottage in Hofton and called it Roxham Bank, Barclays Bank Roxham. The two uh, pubs, which were licensed under the T 
ca uh, under the bench covering Hofton, the bench of magistrates covering Hofton and the Lysing Authority, but they were called Roxham. They paid their duties to the Hofton Authority and they were called Roxham King's Head and Roxham Horseshoes. A man named Arnold Roy, who had a brother and was in business at Coltersville, previously at Reapham, he came along and bought a little grocer's establishment uh, which was really a shed built on the end of uh, two cottages. He bought that just before 1900, the turn of the century, and set out to build, in his own words, a Fortnum and Mason establishment in Hofton, and he called it Roxham. And then it has grown and grown and grown in this world until here in 1876 you have nearly 130 establishments in Hofton, within the boundaries of Hofton, calling themselves Roxham. Roxham telephone number. Roxham address. Roxham advertise. You don't often hear Hofton mentioned, the village of Hofton. But they set such an example of calling Hofton Roxham that you know when you speak of it, you have to be very, very careful to, if you wish to be exact, to know exactly what to call this establishment and that establishment. Of course, it happens elsewhere, but it happened here and has caused for, I should think, nearly a hundred years now, has called certain places in Hofton to be called Roxham, and they're still called Roxham. And they all pay their rates from Hofton to the district council on the other side of the river, on, on their own side of the river. Roxham, in the last transfer of uh, local authorities, Roxham had previously come under Stalin. The Taverham bench in Norwich. Council Chambers. Now Hopton comes under the North Norfolk District Council and the Council Chambers are Cromer, 18 miles away, and Roxham comes under the Broadland District Council and the Broadland offices out in Norwich. Uh, it's uh, interesting to note that had John Loins had his own way in 1878 and uh, established himself in Houghton, then he would have called it John Loins of Roxham. He would never have established in, in Roxham at all. A large map in the 1890s shows half of Roxham belonging to W.F. Green agent <coughs> and uh, as agent for the Trafford Hall estate and uh, the other half belonging to Blake Humphrey, Colonel Blake Humphrey, who had the uh, more high class side of the village. In 1890, the, all the land belonging to the Blake Humphrey estate on the river bank bordering the river Bure in Roxham was all put up for sale. Part of the broad was sold, uh, put up for sale, but it didn't sell. And uh, right away from Roxham Broad to Roxham Bridge, about a mile and a quarter, there's uh, a long range of uh, bungalows, very nice thatched bungalows that look very, very attractive, which uh, John Nodittle, a local uh, historian, called the aristocrats of Roxham, the bungalows, I mean. And then W.F. Green, nearer to Roxham Bridge, had some land also, which he put up for sale, and the Trafford family now have some land on the Roxham side 
which is let mainly for the boat building industry. But at Hopton, which is just pure marshland and virgin bog in the earlier days, quite an enterprising number of people have cut great inlet, inlets, uh, cuts inland to let the water through and formed the yacht basin uh, and quite a lot of mooring inland and uh, established a very, very busy place and that's been growing ever since the turn of the century. At the time of the Education Act of 1902 and before that with the uh, school boards, Roxham made strides for two reasons. The vicar, who was also united with Sellers, he had two livings, was a remarkable man. Absolutely, <coughs> absolutely dedicated to education and uh, the uh, and church matters. At that time, there came a man named Mr. G. M. Davis. He came from Sheffield. He was a good singer, and he was an excellent uh, schoolmaster. And he and the vicar between them in my opinion, laid a very solid foundation of character in the people of Roxham. Hopton was inferior to Roxham in those days and quite a number of Hopton people came, uh, Hopton children came to Roxham School for education, so much so that they, there was a represent representative on the school board and on the school managers later for the Hopton people in the interest of the Hopton children. Uh, and that still attains in 1976. The school got an excellent reputation. And from one period of the teaching, round about the turn of the century and, and the close years, into the 19th, 20th century. And their wives. And when I see the nine, I think of the... And the Reverend and the Mr. G. M. Davis created a body of men and a body of parishioners who were determined to do their best in life. And during one period of that time, Pupils from Roxham School, within a period of six years, pupils from Roxham School left school and all started in business on their own account. And may I say it, they made a success of them. And I have put that down entirely to the good instruction of Mr. Reverend Boddington and his church helpers with Sunday school and boys' classes and uh, reading rooms and so on. And uh, Mr. Davis, for his choir master, he was the choir master for 30 years at Roxham Church. That leadership and instruction given by the schoolmaster, that serious view on life created by the Reverend Boddington and his church helpers combined to make a body of men who distinguished themselves in later in the 1914 Great War. The Roxham Memorial carries the name of 17 men who went across and gave their lives and of those who came home, there was one DCM, two military medals, and gallant men who joined the Royal Flying Corps, 
and craftsmen who were not required at war built aeroplanes at a Norwich factory in the first onslaught on the on the German army in France and Belgium. One may perhaps better understand what is meant by the influence, that peculiar influence of the vicar. You don't get it today. <laughs> Here is an extract written by the schoolmaster at the time of the death of the Reverend Boddington. Prefixed by a little item about myself. I was sent to school at Roxham before I was four years old, and I venture to say it didn't do me any harm. There were ten children in our family, and I was number six. And quite a lot of trouble at home. and a smaller infant room. Mr. George Davis was the schoolmaster. Mrs. Davis was the infant's teacher. Miss Maria Hall was her assistant for infants. And Miss Bunn and Miss Groom in the large room were the assistants to Mr. G.M. Davis, the schoolmaster. There was always more noise in the infant's room than in the large room, and no doubt I contributed my quota to that, especially if for short I called uh, Miss Maria Hall Raya, that gal Raya, because that was a very serious thing to do. She then gave me what she called a box of the ears, but what Daddy called a ding of the lugs. The parson, the Reverend Boddington, came into our room at different times, and then we had to wipe our noses and call him sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. And Maria was always watching for any little mischief to, to give us, anyone who misbehaved, one of those Ding of the lugs, as Daddy called them. But not until after the old parson had gone. <laughs> the parson's name was Boddington. B-O-D-D-I-N-G-T-O-N. And I must have been three or four years before I could spell it properly. He was fond of mathematics and mental arithmetic. So we call him old two twos a four. Here he come, look out. Wipe your snitch. Call him old two twos a four. We got another ding of lugs. That's what Daddy called him. Raya was quite a good teacher, but she splashed a bit from the mouth when she was talking. I said to Daddy, we shall have to get an umbrella. He said, you'll get a ding of the rug if she hear you. And I did. Daddy said that land ya. Coda didn't have sting. This item was taken from Roxham School Records and is dated March the 29th, 1904. The heading was Death of the Reverend T. Boddington. The Reverend T. Boddington died early this morning at about five o'clock. It is difficult to realize the truth of the foregoing statement. Yesterday morning he was, to all appearances, in his usual good health. After the meeting here, he attended a, manage meeting, a manager's meeting at the Salhouse School and took the chair and even in the evening attended a meeting at Bluefield some distance away, probably about four or five miles. In the evening, he retired to bed 
apparently in good health, but was taken ill about 4 o'clock a.m. and died at 5 o'clock. He has been vicar of Broxhamwood Salhouse for upwards of 30 years, and during the whole of that time has taken an active interest in this school. He was chairman of the Roxham School Board from its formation in 1875 until the passing of the Education Act of 1902, which did away with the school boards. For the past 13 years, he has called at the school when he has been at home at about once or twice a week. The children always welcomed him. The teachers were always pleased to see him. For all in the school, he had a cheery word. With the infants, he was a great favorite. And the older children looked to his hymns coming into their room. The top class were often puzzled by his questions on mental arithmetic. He was a student of the Peterhouse College, Cambridge, of which the late Barnard Smith was a fellow, and it's evident he got his tastes for mathematics there at Cambridge, as could be recognized. The Barnard Smith annual, when he drew it from his jacket pocket, to ask his questions. He was always a friend to the children and teachers, never advocating a policy which might interfere with the efficiency of the school. He was always interested in the children's concerts, and if at home at the vicarage, he made a point of coming and being present. At such a time, the parents had the benefit of his advice regarding the sending of their children regularly to school and pointed out the advantages to teachers and it is thought that from the regularity of the scholars' attendance, without doubt his timely word has had much to do with the percentage of attendances to which the school has attained. He was always proud to hear of the school having done well when visited by one of Her Majesty's inspectors. He took mu much pride in the school being kept clean and in good order and did not like the alterations in prospect being taken out of the manager's hands. Registers and requisitions were always signed without question when he was in the chair. His argument being the head teacher knew best what was required. All connected with the school feel they have lost a good friend. That tribute was written by the headmaster and reveals the great understanding which existed between the vicar and the head teacher. And here is a tribute written by a school manager. It appeared in a local newspaper, March the 30th, 1904. The sudden death of the Reverend T. Boddington removes a notable and dignified personality from the ranks of the Norfolk clergy. It is given to no man to choose the circumstances of his natural death. But we are sure 
that had it been given to Mr. Boddington to choose, nothing would have gratified him more to know that it would be vouchsafed to him to participate act actively in the educational administration of his district. Right up to the end, it was significant as to what was his chief interest that Monday afternoon he attended a meeting of school managers at Roxham, apparently in his usual health. He was reported to have had one of the longest terms of conscientious service as a school board chairman in England, having presided over the Roxham District School Board Managers since its establishment in the 70s, down to the appointed day for the abolition of the board schools in September last, as evidence of his educational zeal it is noted that Roxham School, amongst the rural parishes of East Norfolk, in having its standard of exemption higher than the general standard of the county, a fact due to the enlightened action taken by the board some three years ago and not perpetuated by the refusal of the Board of Education to permit the reduction by the County Council of any existing standard. He was a hard and unobstructive worker and a man of wide scholarly and intellectual interests. If you stood on Roxham Bridge about 1900, 1901, or a few years previously, or even succeeding years, you would see, if you looked north, the, the, the trunk of the bridge, the, uh, the passage onto the bridge, lay almost north and south. And if you looked north, you would be looking upstream, and there across the meadows, uh, before the growth which now ob obstructs the view, there across the meadows you would see the black sails of Weddies sailing down toward Roxham, and you'd, you would see them at the railway viaduct, lower their mast, lower their sail first, and their mast, with a precision which was interesting to watch. The uh, sail of a wherry was geared up and uh, raised. It was a very, very heavy sail, like a fishing smack sail. It was uh, raised up by a winch, a two-handled winch. It took two men to, to get it up. And uh, the mast, when it was raised, was balanced. There was a pivot in what they call the cheek boards or the tabernacle of the wherry. And below that pivot, when the mast was up, was the extension or the bottom piece of the mast heavily weighted with a lump of lead, uh, a cast, a casting of lead. And above, the ma above that pivot also was the mast that carried the sail. <coughs> well, the watermen approaching the viaduct bridge and the two hotels or ale houses that lay between the two bridges, which were constructed between the two bridges in that little short stretch of water. As they approached the bridge, you'd see the sail come down in what we call the station reach. And uh, it came down with the, rather quickly, it had a break on it. Uh, it didn't have to be wound down. They just put it off the ratchet and regulated its fall with a brake. Then the sail was disconnected very rapidly and the uh, stay, which held the mast upright was released 
and uh, was held by a, a wherryman who had to be very secure with this. And the, uh, the plate or the retaining gate at the bottom which held the lead block attached to the mast was released and then the mast just cabbed, uh, gradually came down with consummate ease. And the judgment of the watermen bringing the wherry through was used while the wherry was still underway and as soon as the mast was down and level with the cabin top or the hatches the vessel came steadily under the bridge and was guided to a suitable mooring plot near one of the alehouses. Sometimes they waited here for the tide, sometimes they waited for the wind but if the wind and tide were favourable, then the mast would be kept down to pass under the road bridge, and uh, they would, the, the wherry would be quanted with two long poles, one man of one on one deck way and one on the other plank way. And uh, when they got through the bridge, they'd moor up. First of all, you'd see the masts go romp romping up because it's very well balanced and uh, at the last when it got into position just to get it exact the uh, wherryman would hold on the forestay and fix it and another wherryman would go down and fix the gate which which held the, uh, the lead in the tabernacle in its proper position Skillfully done, there was no danger. Lazily done, and there was big danger. For In the 1890s, the ready traffic was a very big item on the River Dewar at Roxham. From Ilcham, by road, 10 miles away, and about the same by water. They transported marl, gravel, corn, malt, and anything a farm could produce and which was necessary to get through Roxham, through Horning, through Acor, down to Yarmouth Harbour, where it was always required for transportation on seagoing boats or seagoing coasters as we called them then to whatever destination they were required but some did actually take uh, their freightage from Yarmouth Harbour up the river Yare to Norwich but even just at the time of the South African War there was a, a feeling in the atmosphere that the wherry trade was waning. The uh, railway was taking over quite a lot of that freightage. In that case, the farmers sent the uh, commodities they wished to transport to uh, Roxham Station, Cortisil Station, Ailsham Station, Buxton Station, or Lower Downstream, perhaps Haeckel Station, or even to, to Yarmouth by road. The farm wagon, with the two wheels at the front smaller than the two back wheels, which were very large, these wheels were iron shod and the farmer's wagon was usually drawn by two cart horses, good strong trotting cart horses, and they were became quite a sight inland as the wedding trade waned. Then came the challenge to the railways in the form of the internal combustion motor car. 
whole mother Shibdom in her prophecies uh, prophesied that in 1901 cars without horses shall run and sure enough over the hill at Roxham Castle came a motor car driven by Mr. G. Christopher Davis, the clerk to the North Norfolk County Council. In 1901, he came over the Castle Hill in a Didian Booten, one of the earliest of cars, and the name was AH1. Mr. Christopher Davis lived in those days at Burnt Fen near Horning. I believe Burnt Fen actually is in Hor in Houghton. Part of it. Uh, there's a stream runs right through the uh, right through the property. At about the same time, a man named Mr. Escort, who was a uh, the chief executive of Daimler Cars in those days came to live at Roxham in the uh, Beach Avenue and he had a, a Daimler car and the first one he brought was stirred not by a wheel but by a bar. You pushed or pulled the bar according to which way you used to go and that car was one of the first in Roxham and it was quickly followed by AH4, which was the, in the ownership of Mr. H.L. Clark, who was the manager of the Royal Hotel Norwich, the Maids Hotel Norwich, and the Great Eastern Hotel at Liverpool Street Station, London. These single-cylinder motor cars single cylinder engine would come chug 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 and coming downhill towards Roxham station it would be chug 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 but going up the hill to get over the bridge chug 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 and away they go along station road and they were item an item of great interest to the local populace. And there was another challenge to the wherry, the motor car, the motor driven vehicle. Not only did the motor car challenge the railway, but it also challenged the steamboats. The, there were steamboats on the river, and in most cases, or nearly all cases, they belonged two private owners. There was Sir Harry Pullard of Norwich and quite a number of owners, uh, some very large farmers and riparian and landowners. These steamboats had enjoyed a very good run on the River Bure at Roxham and upstream and lower downstream and often met on Roxham Broad in a rather larger assembly, might be six or seven of them. And it was inevitable about 1897, 1898, that the, the builders catering for pleasure produced steamboats. Ambrose Thraw had one called the Vivid. The King's Head Hotel at Afton Roxham had one called the Lindhurst. George Smith of the Horseshoes had the Blanche and also the Sombra. And there was one called the Golden Arrow. Ambrose Thraw sailed his steamboat, the Vivid, from his moorings at Roxham Bridge to Roxham Broad and back at sixpence per person and was doing quite a good trade. The expenses then were not like they are today. 
George Smith at the Horseshoes, his effort in 1900 was uh, the first commencement of what is now the Broad's Tours. And Broad's Tours has grown to a large company with much more modern boats, motor boats, of course. And they, they started from the Golden Arrow, a little boat called the Harty, and the Blanche, as they went out of action, some had uh, steam engines replaced by motor engines, chiefly Brooks of Gloucester. Brook Marine were making motor engines then, two-cylinder, three-cylinder, and four-cylinder. And they were, I think they were not quieter, but they were more apt, more adaptable to river use than a steamer. For one thing, they had no funnel to pull down every time they came to a bridge. And thus we got a steamboat converted to a motorboat called the King Edward by Mr. Thraw. And the Sombra was converted with an engine, a brook engine. The Blanche, I've lost sight of what happened to her. The Harty had a little uh, motor engine put in, and but there was also catering for the holiday district, the holiday people. Spurned the motor engine and continued with the question of sailing craft. Loins continued to build yachts more suitable to the broads than the older ones he built. Ernest Collins came along. He converted wherries uh, from vessels of freightage to vessels for passengers. The Norfolk Broad Yacht Company made smaller boats. They built some very nice little boats to sleep two people or four people. And Ernest Collins had a range of boots called the Normans. They were for two or, or four, four people. Alfred Collins stuck to sailing boots until the question uh, was necessary to introduce a motor boot for day work. And so he built a boot called the Broadland Bell. And uh, Loins built a boot called the Osprey and a smaller one called the Blossom. George Smith enlarged his holding and with his son William Smith and the other son, an engineer, Clifford Smith, they, they began to build up a much bigger fleet of motorboats. And their prime boat was the Princess Mary. They just called it the Mary, but the Princess Mary was the proper name, and that was the first big advancement to passenger boats that would carry up to 80 people. And this style of business prospered until the First World War, when almost everything stopped, not entirely, but almost everything because of the numbers of watermen who joined the forces to go to the French canals and freightage, carry on freightage there, of war materials of all kinds, up the French canals from Calais or Boulogne or Le Havre, and they went up to the front line to the tune Rockingham, saint Omer, Armentier, Pax Amour, Alice, and right to the Somme, Bapoum, Peron, and Amiens. And the business on the River Bure at Roxham fell in the doldrums. I joined the army in 1914. 
And then I came home in 1915 on a short seven-day leave, and on that occasion I sailed one of Ernest Collins' yachts with two officers on board to because they couldn't sail and Ernest Collins knew I could. I sailed them for several days, right around from Roxham, Horning, Fern, Potterheim, up to Hickling, up to Horsey Mare, and back again. And that took several days. And that just shows you that the broads were still open, but there was no one to do the sailing. I was in uniform, and I was making that my holiday. I mean, that was rather necessary because our income from the army was a shilling a day. But I got more than that from Mr. Ernest Collins. It was in 1901 that Mr. Ernest Collins conceived the idea of building a boat for sailing on the broads, a racing boat. based on the shamrocks that Sir Thomas Lipton was using to try and win the America Cup. About the same time, Mr. Herbert Bunn thought he would do the same thing because there was a great rivalry just at that period, at the turn of the century, amongst all the boat builders and designers and those with new ideas as to how to build a boat, a great rivalry, and that was kept going by the various regattas that were held. And uh, each of these builders and designers and uh, schemers, I would call them, sailed their boats to, uh, from Roxham to the various regattas, and they had a real tussle. It was a wonderful sight to see four or five boats from Roxham 